So, <coughs> yeah. So last time we talked about uh, group operations. So that, <coughs> so we have a group G acting on a set X. So this is a map from G times X to X. So G pair of G and X is mapped to something called G times X, which satisfies uh, two axioms, um, namely that uh, if we kind of uh, twice act with two elements in this way, we compose the action twice is the same as if we multiply the elements in the group and act by that. And then the identity element should act as the identity. So this is for all x and all g and h. And uh, we had introduced uh, two important uh, uh, concepts connected with group operations. One is the uh, stabilizer, so, and the other one is the orbit. So the stabilizer of an element will just be uh, the set of all elements in the group which map it to itself. So this is Gx, which is the set of all G and G, such that G times X is equal to X. And we also have the orbit, which uh, is just all the elements of X. So the so orbit of an element X in X will be uh, the set of all elements of X which we can read by act, reach by acting by elements of G on it. So this is G of X, which is a, a set of all G times X is G in G. So this is a subgroup of G, and this is a subset of X. <laughs> and uh, we had seen that if we have a group operation, then uh, <coughs> there is an, uh, we get a decomposition of uh, X into disjoint uh, subset. So then the, the orbits, the different orbits form a decomposition of X into disjoint sets because they are actually equivalence classes of an equivalence relation. And we finished by the orbit stabilizer theorem which said that, uh, well, we have a group G acting on a set X. And uh, we take R, a system of representatives for the orbits. So in other words, this is a set which contains one element out of each orbit. And then uh, we find that the number, so I, I want g x on x. No? And uh, in this case, say x is finite. Um, then uh, the number of elements of x is equal, this is kind of trivial, sum over all x, uh, over all these representatives of the number of elements in the orbit of X. This is just the statement that X is the union, the disjoint union of the orbits. And uh, we can rewrite this as the sum over all X in R of the index of G in GX. Because one finds that the number of elements in the orbits is precisely the index of GX in G. Okay, so this is actually a very simple result, but it's uh, useful and therefore it's a theorem. So now we wanted to now we want to look at the special uh, case of an action, namely the action of a group by itself by conjugation. of a group G 
on itself. So, first, what does it mean, conjugation? So, we have G a group, and we see they say that G and H in G are conjugated. If, um, if there is an element A in, uh, so if there exists element A in G, such that, say, H is equal to A G A to the minus 1. And you can easily see that this is an equivalence relation. This is a trivial exercise. And so we can look at the equivalence classes, which are called conjugacy classes. G of elements um, are called conjugacy classes of G. Um, so, <clears throat> okay, we will want to say something about this conjugacy class and we want to see that this, uh, that this actually is an operation of G on itself. So, Let's first define something more. Um, so if x, so for an element x in the group, uh, the centralizer of this element consists of all elements commuting with it. So let uh, x in G, so the centralizer of x is just, uh, so I write it with z, z of x to be the set of all g and g, such that gx is equal to xg. So these are all elements which commute with our given element x. Have some simple remark. Uh, first, the centralizer of any element x is a subgroup of G. Um, that's very easy. Then um, I can look at the center. In the exercise, I used the different notations C of G, but uh, I want it now with a Z. Z of G of G is, uh, I mean, we know it's a normal subgroup of G, and this will always be, is a subgroup of the centralizer of any element X. Well, that's obvious by definition. I mean, the center consi consists of all elements in the group which commute with all elements in the group. So in particular, that's uh, a subset of uh, all those which commute with a given element x. And it's ob also obviously a subgroup. And uh, finally, uh, we have an element x in G is in the center if its centralizer is the whole of G. Again, this is trivial because the, <coughs> the elements in the center are the elements in the group which commute with all elements in the group. 
And you know, that's precisely what's being said here. OK, so this, uh, this is really a remark. There's nothing to prove. E everything is directly from the definition. So the, it turns out that the conjugacy classes are uh, you know, somehow a very important invariant of the group. And one, uh, if one wants to understand the group, one has to uh, understand the conjugacy classes. We will not really do that. Maybe in the <coughs> Uh, next uh, semester, you will also hear something about representation theory of groups. And uh, you find, for instance, there's a close relation between the representations of a group and the conjugacy classes of the group. So, <coughs> but um, now we want to describe this, uh, uh, and we want to describe the conjugacy action of a group on itself. Uh, so that the uh, conjugacy classes will actually be the orbits. So definition so the conjugation or action of G on itself is just uh, the obvious thing is just uh, is defined by uh, g times h is equal to, say, a g h g to the minus 1. OK, so the element g acts on the element h by this conjugation. So by definition, the orbits are precisely the conjugacy the are precisely the conjugacy classes these equivalence classes are precisely the conjugacy classes Um, G. So the the conjugacy class of an element G is the same as the orbit, because you know after all, this is precisely how it was defined. And we note also that uh, the stabilizer um, of an element say x in G with respect to this conjugation action is precisely the uh, centralize of x. No, because uh, by definition, the centralizer of x is equal to the set of all g and g, such that uh, g x g to the minus 1 is equal to x. And this is obviously equal by multiplying by both sides by g, and multiplying on this side by g to the set of all g and g, such that g x is equal to x g, which is um, so now I said it precisely wrong. So this is the, the uh, stabilizer is uh, by definition this, and this is the centralizer of X. So this this statement is also obvious. So now we um, we just um, basically. We just want to reformulate the orbit stabilizer theorem for this conjugation action. And then it become, gets a new uh, name. It's called the class equation. So it's just uh, another way to count, in some sense, the elements 
in the group. But um, <coughs> but it's um, and it's actually just a special case of the orbit stabilizer theorem. But still, it's a useful result. Therefore, uh, it gets its own name. So theorem. So class equation. So we take G a finite group. And uh, so we take R uh, to be a set. So, uh, so a subset of G, which contains uh, precisely one element from every conjugacy class. So such that. Um, every element in G modulo the centralizer of minus the centralizer of G. So every element in G which does not lie in the center of G is conjugated to precisely one element in <coughs> in R. Precisely one element in R. Okay, then uh, the number of elements in G is equal to the number of elements in the center of G plus the sum over all elements in R of the index of um, the centralizer of x in G. So in some sense, <coughs> note that in some sense I've come here, it's formulated in some sense in an unnecessarily complicated way, as we will see in a moment. Um, but this is usually the way one wants to use it. So that's why we write it like this. So note we can say it also as follows. So, so, so maybe I can prove it and prove it and then we can see. So we take a system of representatives of the con of the orbits of the conjugation action of G of on itself, then um, maybe don't need this. Then we can apply the orbit stabilizer theorem, and that says that the uh, so by the orbit stabilizer theorem we have that the number of elements in G is the uh, sum over all x in R of um, the index, so of R prime was our system of representatives, the index of the stabilizer with respect to the conjugation action of uh, this x in G. And uh, we remember that we had just seen that sta this stabilizer was actually the centralizer of x. So we get this formula, still with a prime. And now <coughs> we have to, we see that <coughs> if our element x 
lies in the center of G, then it commutes with all other elements. So uh, its centralizer is the whole of G. So this index is equal to 1. And so <coughs> we put just, so it means <coughs> that, um, on other words, we also have that um, if it lies in the center of G, then it's also clear that the orbit G of X is just equal to X, because after all, by, by conjugation, no? because uh, it commutes with uh, every element g in g. So if I make g x g to the minus 1, then this is equal to x. So <coughs> it means that the center, <coughs> so, so uh, therefore, we can put just put minus the center of g. So the <coughs> if you have an element in the center, then uh, it is automatically equal to its own conjugacy class. So uh, in R prime, all the elements of the center are you know, represented. And we just remove these. And in, in that case, the <coughs> if, we are, if we have an element in the center, then this index is equal to 1, because these two are equal. And so this formula is just equal to the number of elements in the center of G plus the sum over all x in R, the index of G Cx. No? So, uh, so we see <coughs> that this is just a, a reformulation of the orbit stabilizer theorem, uh, where we also kind of have singled out the elements in the center, um, because uh, we have uh, there the orbit contains only one element. OK. So now we want to use this to show that uh, a, any group which has a, uh, as number of elements uh, the square of a prime number is a B. So we know. So if um, so, so let P be a prime prime number. We know, we proved it some time, that um, if we take, uh, so if, um, if the number of elements in a group is equal to p, then p is cyclic. In particular, it is what? Yeah, I mean, what it wouldn't make much sense otherwise. Yeah, then G is cyclic. So now we want to see what happens uh, for the next case when we have a square. So now the, we want to show uh, if the number of elements in G is p squared, uh, then G is abelian or commutative. And for this, we want to use this, uh, this result. So the first uh, statement is ah. so maybe uh, do I, did I give the definition? Yeah. So first, I want to give general definition. So if I have a group, 
So P is still a prime number. A group P, uh, G, is called a P group. Um, if the number of elements in the group is a power of P. Uh, if uh, there exists a number n bigger than 0, such that the number of elements in G is equal to P to the n. We'll see that. Uh, uh, when we do the Seeloff theorems that they also have something to do with P groups contained in given groups. So, and now <coughs> the first uh, statement we want to make that the center of a P group has at least, uh, uh, the number of elements in the center of a P group is at least P. So, proposition Let G be a P group. So the number of elements in the group is some power of P. Then the number of elements in the center of G is at least P. Okay, so we want to prove that. So we assume that uh, the number of elements in G is equal to P to the N for some N bigger than zero. And we know that the center, I mean, we know the center of G is a subgroup of G. So uh, we know that the number of elements in the subgroup always will divide the number of elements in the group for finite groups. So we know thus uh, the number of elements in Z of G divides um, the number of elements in G. But uh, obviously, the divisors of p to the n are, you know, are just the powers of p. So 1, p, p squared, until p to the n minus 1. So it follows, thus, the number of elements in G is a power of p. No. So it would be p to the m, where m is bigger or equal to 0. But it could also be that m is equal to 0, so that the center has only one element, in which case we would not have proven our proposition. So we only have to see. So therefore, it is enough to see that the center of G is not equal to 1. That there's at least one non-trivial element. Because we know that the number of elements in the center is a power of P. So it must be a positive power of P. So it's at least P. OK. So we assume uh, uh, by indirect argument, we assume that the center of G is equal to 1. So in particular, the center of G has precisely one element. So then we apply the class equation. So what does it say? It says that the number of elements in G which we happen to know is p to the n, is 1. No, 1 is the number of elements in the center. 
plus the sum over all x and r of uh, the index of the centralizer of x in G, where r was a, a, a system of representatives for the non-trivial conjugacy classes. So it means that uh, so x so a system of representatives for the conjugacy classes with more than one element. Or, in other words, for the for the conjugacy classes of elements which do not lie in the center of X. So, but so here the sum is precisely over those elements for which the centralizer is not equal to the whole of G. The centralizer is a subgroup. So, <coughs> so maybe I can also write this. So this is equal the set of all x, so representatives for, a, for uh, no, anyway. So I just say it again. So if I have um, an element here, we take precisely the um, representatives of conjugacy classes uh, for which the centralizer, uh, for, for which the conjugacy class is more than one element, so where the element is not does not lie in the center, which is equivalent to the fact that the centralizer of x is not equal to g. So, so for x and r, we have that the centralizer of x is not equal to g. But the centralizer of x is a subgroup. So, but uh, z of x in this case is a subgroup. Of G. So we know that the number of elements in a subgroup is a power of p, and so we take p to the n divided by a smaller power of p. So the number of elements here will be a, this index is a positive power of p. So we find that for all x and r, we have that this index is divisible by p. So to say it again, we know that um, this is a subgroup of G, which is not equal to G. So its number of elements is a power of, of p, which is smaller than uh, this n. And so uh, the quotient is uh, a positive power of p. This is divisible by p. But then we see our contradiction. We have that p to the n is 1 plus something divisible by p. That contradiction, p to the n is equal to 1 plus uh, a number divisible by p. Okay, and so with this, uh, we find that indeed it's not true that the center consists only of one element, and so therefore it is a positive power of p, and therefore it's bigger or equal to p. Now we want to prove this statement, which I announced here, that if I have a group such that the number of elements uh, is p squared for a prime number, then it's abelian. So the proposition uh, 
every group of order p squared, where p is a prime, is a beacon. So we know, for instance, that all groups of order 4 are b. On the other hand, we know that the symmetric group in three letters, which has six elements, is non-abelian. So anyway, so let so we take such a group. So we have to show. So we want to show the group is commutative. So. We can reformulate this in a different way. So we have to, so G is a B in. If for all elements X in G, we have that the centralizer of X is equal to the whole of G. This is just by definition. The centralizer of X is the set of all elements in G which commute with X. And so if for every element, in X, the set of all elements which commute with X is everything. It means every element commutes with every element. So let's see. So we want to show that. So obviously, if X, so. So now, if we have such an, so let's take an element in X, in G. So if X is an element in the center of G, then obviously the centralizer of X is equal to G, essentially by definition. On the other hand, if x does not lie in the center of g, which actually will finally not be able to happen if g is a beacon, but if we assume we have an element x which does not lie in the center of g, then um, it means that if I take the centralizer of x, this certainly contains x because uh, obviously x commutes with itself and it also contains the center of g because the elements in the center of g compute commute with every element but x does not lie in the center of g so this contains p elements so it means it contains these elements, all the elements in the center, plus uh, also x itself. But we know uh, the number of elements of the center of G is bigger or equal to p, and we and then so the number of elements in the centralizer of x is strictly bigger than the number of elements in the center of g because we have also the element x. So that means the number of elements in z of x is bigger or equal to p plus 1. But the centralizer of x is a subgroup of G. And so G has P squared elements and we have a subgroup which has at least P plus 1 elements. You know, as the number of elements of a subgroup must be a divisor, you know, there, there is no divisor which is bigger or equal to P plus 1 of uh, P squared except for P squared itself. So it follows that uh, so as number of elements of C of X is a divisor of uh, p squared, 
so m of elements of g equal to p squared, it follows that z of x is actually equal to g. So we have found that for every element x in g, the center is equal to g, so it means g is commutative. I mean, if you think this to the end, obviously, we find that uh, this case actually does not occur because the group is commutative. We have proven it's commutative, so it does, it all, X is always uh, in the center of G because all elements are, but you know, we are making an indirect argument, so that's okay. Okay, so this uh, was this result. So now <coughs> I want to, uh, I mean, are there any questions? About this? Comments? Good time. So now I want to uh, look at uh, I mean something a bit more special. I want to look at the symmetric group again. And I want in particular to understand the conjugacy classes of the symmetric group. So I will um, <coughs> we have talked about the symmetric group in n letters before and now I want to look at it slightly more carefully. So talk about the symmetric group Sn. So we want to describe this group more precisely. We will <coughs> introduce um, uh, new notations for elements in the symmetric group in terms of so-called cycles. And then we want to see that the conjugacy classes uh, of uh, the symmetric group can be described in terms of these cycles, the lengths of the cycles. So, so recall that Sn, this was the set of all bijections. from the set 1n to itself. With the, the as a group operation, uh, the uh, <coughs> composition. So sigma tau was equal to sigma composed with tau. And there's a <coughs> Okay. We had introduced the notation so for sigma so we write sigma as some kind of a matrix where we write on the top the numbers 1, 2 and so on until n and in the bottom we write the images, so sigma of 1, and so this is certainly a way how one can describe all permutations. Now we want to introduce a new uh, notation in terms of so-called cycles. which many of you might also know. So I um, can just say it definition. So say let we take some elements A1 to AR be distinct elements of our set 1 to n. So we take, uh, we pick out our numbers from 1 to n, different numbers. And then the cycle a1 to ar is the following permutation.
Well, it's what one might think if one uh, understands the word cycle. It means that uh, it should be something which, map, which maps A1 to A2, A2 to A3, and so on, AR minus 1 to AR, and the AR back to A1. And all other elements which are not A1, among A1 to AR should stay fixed. So, um, so is the map. Um, it's the permutation sigma in Sn, uh, such which is given by sigma of AI is equal to AI plus 1 if um, for I equals 1 to R minus 1. And uh, sigma of AR should be, uh, well, maybe just say that, well, whatever. And sigma of AR, so A1 for I equal R. So sigma of AR is equal to A1. So you really have like, you, if you would kind of put them all on a circle, you kind of turn it once around. And uh, obviously, and sigma of B is equal to B for all B which do not belong to the set A1 to AR. So this is the cycle. So we call R, the number R, is called the length of the cycle. of the cycle A1 to AR. And um, we say that if I have a cycle of length R, I also call it R cycle. So and uh, in particular, the two cycles uh, are somewhat more important, and they are called transpositions. So a two-cycle transposition. So, you know, if you have a two cycle, it just means you have two elements, A1, A2, and the, the corresponding permutation kind of ex exchanges them and leaves all other ones fixed. And you know, maybe call, so we call A1 to AR the support of this cycle. And uh, we call to, uh, some cycles disjoint if their supports are disjoint. So cycles um, A1 to AR. B1 to S are called disjoint. Well, if the corresponding sets of elements in 1N are disjoint, so if and only if, uh, if I take the set A1 to AR, then this does not intersect set B1 to BS. They don't have any common elements. So we can first, we have an obvious remark. Um, you know, cycles are, after all, you know, these are permutations. You know? And it is, I claim it is obvious to see that 
disjoint cycles commute. So that means if um, E1 to AR and B1 to BS are disjoint cycles, so these, this set of these elements does not intersect. There is no common elements here. Um, are disjoint cycles. Uh, then A1 to AR times B1 to BS is equal to the other way around. Now that's kind of obvious because um, you know <coughs> what these things do to elements has nothing to do with each other. So if I apply this to ele any element k, then uh, if k is among uh, uh, the b one to b s, then I will apply this part to it, and this will not do anything. And this is what it will, it will do the same here, and uh, the same if it is one of the a's. And if it doesn't belong to any of these, it will anyway be the identity. So in any case, they do the same thing. So now <coughs> we uh, want to show that every uh, element in the symmetric group can be decomposed, I mean written as a product of disjoint cycles, essentially in a unique way. So theorem. So every element say sigma in Sn is the product uh, sigma equal to sigma one to times sigma whatever s of disjoint cycles okay and uh, so if we require that so disjoint means pairwise disjoint So no two of them have any element in common. No, whatever. So if we require that if I take the union of the supports of the cycles, that this is equal to the whole of the set 1n, then this decomposition is unique. Uh, if we require that uh, the union i equals 1 to s, the support, so uh, that uh, the union of the supports of the cycles is 1n, then this decomposition is unique up to obviously reordering. Obviously, as the cyc disjoint cycles commute, I can always order them, but I claim that the number of uh, cycles and precisely which cycles they are is unique. It's determined by sigma. So this uh, second part I will not actually prove, so I kind of make this an exercise, although it essentially follows from what I prove. But, uh, and um, so this decomposition, so in this, <coughs> so under this assumption, so the, well, maybe I don't need that now, it's coming, I do later. Where is it? Uh, 
Yeah. Okay. So we will call so definition. So if we have such a decomposition into pairwise disjoint cycles, such that the union of the supports is everything, uh, we call this the cycle decomposition of sigma. So in case, so. Composition sigma equal to sigma one to sigma n into disjoint cycles with um, uh, whose union is one n, so such that the union of the supports. is one n is called the cycle decomposition of sigma. So by the above, it is unique. So we can look at an example if I have it somewhere. Well, whatever, so we can look at, uh, for instance, let's look at, uh, so, uh, cycle decomposition of, uh, say, the element 1, 6, what is it, 2, 2, Three, four, five, six, five, three, four, one. So how do we do this? <coughs> so we can say we start with the element one, it is sent to six. Element six is sent to one. So we have a cycle, so we have here one cycle is one, six. So if you take the element two, it's mapped to itself. So that's also a cycle. Um, now we take the element 3. It's mapped to 5. 5 is mapped to 4. And 4 is mapped to 3. So back to 3. And that would be our cycle decomposition. Um, <coughs> so one one thing that one should obviously notice is that um, if you have a one cycle, it's just a map which sends one element to itself and all other elements to itself, it's just the identity. So one cycles are just the identity. And so this is why I had to assume that the support is everything in order to get uniqueness. Otherwise, I would have had to assume that it doesn't contain any one cycles. That would also be possible. And then you can also see that uh, this notation, the notation is not precisely unique. So if you have this element, for instance, 3, 4, 5, so, or whatever, if you have the element 1, 2, 3, this is the map which sends 1 to 2, and 2 to 3, and 3 to 1. But I can also write it as 2, 3. 1, because it's the same thing. 1 is mapped to 2, 2 is mapped to 3, and 3 to 1. So you can, uh, so the, the, the decomposition into cycles is unique, but the notation is not unique. You can always kind of rotate them and get the same element. OK, so now I want to prove this theorem. Maybe I first, no, maybe I can first prove the theorem. So that's, um, so as I said, I wanted to only prove the existence, but the uniqueness is actually quite easy. 
So, proof So, <coughs> well, we will find that, uh, so how does one do this? What are these cycles? So what you actually find is that, you know, if you take the element sigma, it has the property that it sends, you know, an element in the cycle to the next element in the cycle that permutes them. So you find that under the operation of the group generated by sigma, the supports of the cycle will be precisely the orbits. And so that's therefore the way how we want to do it. So let H equal to the cyclic subgroup generated by sigma. So if I take the map, so we have this map of multiplication of elements in 1n uh, by powers of, by elements in h, so we have the multiplication from h times 1n to 1n, which is just, you know, we take an element in the subgroup generated by sigma, and we apply it to this. So tau i is mapped to tau of i. So this is obviously an operation. Of h on 1 n. So basically, it's just we have the operation of the symmetric group on the set 1n by just applying you know, the element in the symmetric group to, to the uh, corresponding set. And now we restrict it to the subgroup H. So we have an operation. And so we can look at the orbits. So we choose some elements, B1 to B, uh, where do you want it? S, such that uh, the <coughs> that the such that if I apply H to B one and so on to H applied to B S, these are the different orbits. of this action. Okay. So we know that uh, so this B1 the set B1 to BS is just a system of representatives for the orbits for this action. And we know that uh, 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 that the set 1n is equal to the disjoint union of the set. Okay. So <clears throat> now, I mean, I've called here, H is just all the powers of this one element, sigma. No? So uh, let's see. We want to write this down. Let me see. So for each element, uh, I equals one. S, we choose the minimal power of sigma such that if I apply 
this power to bi, I will get bi back. So let mi be equal to the minimum over all k positive integers uh, such that if I take sigma and apply it k times, so sigma to the k of bi is equal to bi. You know, this element sigma is an element in a finite group, so there is some positive power of it, which is the identity element. And so certainly there is some minimal positive power, which is the identity on this one element, bi. So then it is easy to see that if I take this element bi, uh, sigma of bi, and so on, sigma of mi minus 1, so the mi power of sigma applied to bi, these are disjoint, uh, distinct elements. They are, they are pairwise distinct. It's like uh, you had in some exercise, so if um, um, if you would have that, uh, you know, for some smaller number, uh, so if two of these would be equal, then you could, uh, you know, multiply with the corresponding power of, uh, so, sigma to the L of pi with uh, uh, then it follows that if I take um, so for we say no zero is more than equal to k, uh, then you see that you can just you know, multiply with sigma, sigma k to the sigma to the minus k, and you would get that bi is equal equal to sigma of l minus k to the bi, and so we have found a, uh, we have found a smaller power which is equal to bi. No, that's uh, <coughs> so we can so these will be pairwise distinct, and how does sigma act on them? So, pairwise, so they are pairwise distinct, and we also see if I take the orbit of our element bi, I claim this is just this element. This is just this uh, are just these elements bi sigma of bi sigma m i minus 1 of bi, because in fact what you find is that if you take uh, sigma, so in fact, um, so in fact by definition if you apply sigma to any element here it gives you the next element and uh, the if you take the this one and you apply sigma to it, you get this. So in fact, if I look at this set here, bi, sigma of bi until sigma mi minus 1 of bi, this is a cycle. Okay. Because uh, we see precisely, you know, by definition, if I apply um, 
<coughs> so let's uh, let's see. Maybe I can explain it slightly better. So if I, you know, so I can anyway. <coughs> So you know, if I you know, obviously this is by definition, if I write it like this, it's it is a cycle. You know, I can write down any distinct elements, I get a cycle. But what I have is that if I take sigma i of uh, so if um, um, so if uh, x is an element in the set. B i sigma of B i sigma m i minus one of B i. Then, if I take sigma of x, this will be, as I said, the next one here cyclically. So this is the same as sigma i of x. If sigma i is the cycle, because the the sigma precisely acts by you know rotating this by one, you know, putting every one to the next and the last one to the first, and this is precisely what sigma i does by being a cycle. So, so thus we get the sigma i for equal to this thing, bi sigma of bi until to sigma mi minus 1 of bi um, for i equals 1 to s are disjoint cycles. I mean, they are disjoint because the elements here are the elements in the orbit. And we know the orbits are disjoint, and the union of the orbits is the whole of x. So who's, uh, such that, uh, and uh, the, uni the, the union of the orbits, the union of their supports is uh, 1n. And um, now, if we take any element in 1n, I claim that it acts by the product of these cycles. So, so we want to claim that sigma is equal to sigma 1 times sigma s. So that we, this is the cycle decomposition. And so we take an element in 1n. And so we have to show that these two permutations do the same thing to it. So obviously, we can, if we apply sigma to it, we get sigma of x. And if we apply this, we get something else. So let's see what we do get. So if, so let x, and, so we know that the union of uh, these sets here is the whole of uh, 1n. So it means that x lies in one of them. So then there exists, and there's a unique uh, uh, i in. So then there is an i in the set 1 to s such that x is an element in uh, in the set bi, sigma of bi sigma mi minus 1 of bi well in fact you know if we take all these elements the union of all these elements is x so we precisely have that x in fact, 
x is equal to bi to the power j no? for some. Um, j with um, j, so not j, so now you should protest if I write nonsense. So sigma to the j of bi with for some j uh, which lies between 0 and mi minus 1, because the elements here are precisely you know, this bi until this. And then, what does sigma do to it? So then, uh, sigma applied to x, obviously, is equal to uh, sigma to the j plus 1 of bi, which uh, <coughs> will either be equal to bi if this was mi if the if this uh, j was equal to mi minus 1 or otherwise it's just the next one So the index is like this. Okay. So the, so that's what the sigma does. And what does sigma? If I take sigma i of b i of x. So if I take sigma j of x for k for j different from uh, from i then this is equal to x because the you know this uh, this cycle only permutes the elements which lie in the which you know only the elements which are here so if it is if our x is none of these elements it is not moved by by this you know it's so the sigma i sends pi to sigma of pi and so on but if i have an element which is none of these here it will just stay fixed and on the other hand, if I take sigma i of x, this is equal to sigma i of uh, uh, sigma j of bi. And you know, this is just we apply the cycle to it. And this, this precisely says we go one step further in the cycle. So this is the i if j is equal to mi minus 1 and uh, sigma j plus 1 of pi if j is different from mi minus 1. And so we see that uh, um, <coughs> um, <coughs> and so if I take sigma um, 1 times, times sigma s of x, then uh, these things commute. So x is not, uh, so the, the sigma k, which are different from, uh, from the sigma i, will not do anything. So this will just be equal to sigma i of x. And this is, uh, which is, as we have seen, the same as sigma of x. Okay, so it's kind of, I mean, I made it maybe a bit more complicated than it is. Somehow, <coughs> you know, these different cycles have nothing to do with each other. And uh, so, the <coughs> so our element x will lie in one of these cycles, and then only the corresponding cycle acts on it. The other ones don't do anything. And therefore, we get the same result. So this uh, will prove the, uh, the result. <coughs> So we see in particular that actually we, in the cycle decomposition, we find that the supports of the cycles are actually the, 
um, the orbits of the uh, of the elements under the powers of uh, the thing we want to decompose. So as a corollary, we find that every element in the semantic group can be written as a product of um, uh, <coughs> transpositions. Let me see where this plus thing is. Every element sigma in Sn is a product of transpositions. So we have <coughs> uh, yeah, so this we for this we just have to see that every cycle is a product of transpositions. So assume we have because every element is in Sn is a product of cycles, so if every Cycle is a product of transposition. We are done. So we write down any cycle, A1 to AR is a cycle. And I claim I can write it as a product of transpositions. In fact, I can just write down what it is. So I say I take A1, A2, A1, A3, and it goes on until A1. comma AR. So I claim this cycle is in this way a product of transpositions. So transposition after all was a two cycle. Well and you know you can just that's kind of clear. So here you want to say that this thing maps A1 to A2. So if you take A1, A1 is mapped to A2 then A2 never occurs again, so A1 is mapped to A2. Now A2 is mapped to A1 here, and A1 is mapped to A3, but then A3 never occurs again, so A2 is mapped to A3, and so on. So it's easy to see, so this is easy to check. So th this shows that um, is a product of transpositions. And as every element in the semantic group is a product of cycles, uh, we are done. So how much time? Uh, basically none. Let me see. So I uh, maybe just give a preview. So um, now we want to use this to describe the conjugacy classes. I mean, as I said, I will only say So we will find that if I have two cycles of the same length, then they are conjugated to each other. And if you have a, you know, if an element in the semantic group have, has a cycle decomposition uh, such that the lengths of the cycles are the same for, for both, if I have two elements which have two cycle decompositions with the same lengths, then they are conjugated to each other and vice versa. So that means the uh, conjugacy class of an element will be uh, determined uh, by precisely by the lengths of the cycle in the cycle decomposition of the element. And uh, if you look here, 
So such a cyclic decomposition is a decomposition into the wet set one, you know, in particular if you take a support of the cycles, this is a decomposition into of the set one n into uh, disjoint subsets. So the number of elements in each cycle, if you take the the tuple of the number of elements in each cycle, this is a, a set of numbers which add up to n. And you do this un up to reordering. So you find that the conjugacy classes are in one one correspondence to the partitions of the number n. So of the ways how you can write the number n as a sum of numbers. And so this we will uh, explore the next time. And the other time, the other thing we will explore the next time is uh, that we also look at the sign of a permutation. So if you have a permutation, then uh, I had uh, told you here that it can be written as a product of transpositions. And uh, this writing this permutation as a product of permutations of uh, transpositions is not unique. There are many ways. But you find out that you can, if you take minus 1 to the power, the number of transpositions you need to write this thing, this is something which only depends on the permutation itself. And this is called the sign of the permutation. We will prove this. <coughs> and uh, OK, that's maybe the beginning. And then after that, we'll start uh, preparing ourselves for proving the Silo theorem.